Chris Cabber now. Yes. Armed police won't be named if they are in the dock next time. Yes. I mean, that doesn't surprise me. I actually think that's quite sensible. OK. Um, and that doesn't mean... And I, I think viewers have to understand that that doesn't mean that they will never be named. It just means that in the first instance that they are unlikely to be named. And we can see why in this very, very sad uh, and distressing example of a police officer who has been found not guilty after, you know, going through our justice system um, and his life is now at threat. Mm. It's, it's sad in the sense that Chris Cabot died or sad in the sense that the police officer's life is at risk? Both. Yeah, Both, I don't, not, this, I don't you know, detect a lot of sadness he about... He shouldn't have been killed in that way. What do you think about that, Well, Russ? I mean, look, I haven't got a legal mind the size of a planet as Paula has. Um, I can only look as a layman. And uh, I can't help feel that it's wrong, and I know it's currently the law and you can apply. We were talking in the green room, mm. weren't we, earlier, uh, Paula, for anonymity mm. in a murder case. Mm. If you're under 18, that's it. Yeah. You're never going to be named. Yeah. Uh, but this is a very sensitive case. And, of course, what came out afterwards about the activity of Chris Cabot or what he got up to, um, it, it, it's just fairly murky. What is sad for me and I'm sure a lot of your viewers is, that we've got a, a, an armed policeman, highly trained, going about his job, uh, dealing with uh, a chap who ultimately ended up dead, who was going to use a car as a lethal weapon. Because mm. um, he was armed with a car, that's what yeah. people are saying. He's not saying he didn't have a weapon, he had a car. And uh, here are the pictures, we won't obviously show the shooting, that's the moment before his death. I don't know, it's... it's but let's, we can actually hear... Yvette Cooper, the Home Secretary, speaking about this and why she is, as a result of this case, changing the rules. When officers act in the most dangerous situations on behalf of the state, it is vital that those officers and their families are not put in further danger during any subsequent legal proceedings. So we will therefore introduce a presumption of anonymity for firearms officers subject to criminal trial following a police shooting in the course of their professional duties up to the point of conviction. Been a really a, a watershed case, this, actually. Yes. I yeah. think because, A, because Chris Cabber was a gangster, however you feel about his, his death, and B, because the, it's, it's a 50-50 one about whether the officer was right or wrong to shoot him. Because he didn't know who was driving. He didn't know who was could driving. Could have been his brother, could have been his son. And this is, what, this is what concerns me about the fact that people are questioning why details of Chris Cabot's um, lifestyle choices uh, were not made public at the time. They weren't relevant. It wasn't relevant who he was. It wasn't relevant what he was doing. What was relevant was how the police officer acted at the time. Was the police officer acting in accordance with the rules of procedure? And that was whether uh, he was going to be charged or not. Mm. And it was, it was after we had the public inquiry where uh, the coroner said it was unlawful killing, that is when then the CPS said, OK, well, we're going to consider right. this now and to prosecute. Was an application made to keep the officer's name private. Yes, it was. And shall, shall I tell you why his name was ultimately made public? Because of the press. The press applied to the court and said that in the interests of justice, mm. that we need to be open. We want to release his details. And the judge said, I'll release his name, but what I won't do is I won't release his address his locale, His photo, actually. We haven't seen what and, he looks and like. And his photo. Yeah, which exactly. is quite important, yeah. yeah. If I'm... Let's take a, a completely unrelated example. Let's say I'm driving a car at 120 miles an hour, so I'm committing a crime. Mm. I go out of control, and in the ensuing crash, I kill a man who's engaged in trying to murder his neighbour. Mm. Do I then... Does then... Am I off the hook on the speeding offence because I killed someone who was engaged in a crime? No, because you weren't going to stop that person from committing the murder. Well, I did. No, but that's not... <laughs> it wasn't your intention. So it wasn't an act, for example, of self-defence. It wasn't an act of you trying to stop a crime being committed. But it was a... It was a happy, well, happy's the wrong word. It was a positive outcome from a criminal act by me to drive my car at 120. 
and therefore it expunges the guilt I may have on the speeding offence. No? No. That's uh, not how the law no, works. No, no. Are you, are you trying to seek advice here, Jeremy? No, is, there, I'm just, is there something that you want you to tell me? If you do something bad and it has a good outcome, yes. does that mean the bad thing is forgiven? That's it, what I'm asking. And this for, is, for obvious reasons. And this is why I have had a job for 25 years. It depends. If you are doing something bad in order for somebody who is doing something far worse to stop them from doing that something far worse, then yes, you could use that as a mitigating okay, circumstance. Okay, not as an accidental but, thing. But yes. Okay, all right, thank you.